Good morning, everyone. This is Julie McDonald with Microcom Technologies, and I'd like to thank all of you for attending today's webinar with MetaGeek. Today's host is Casey Cathy. He is their customer experience specialist, and he'll be presenting today. If anyone has any questions, please submit them in the question box, and Casey will answer them at the end of today's presentation. Casey, thank you so much for being with us today. Appreciate your time and all of your useful information regarding MetaGeek, and we are ready to go, so you can go ahead and take it on over. All right, awesome. Thank you, Julie. Uh, hey, everyone. Thanks for joining. This webinar is going to showcase uh, um, some MetaGeek products that are uh, all available at Microcom. This is just a, a product overview. Um, on the agenda today, I'm going to introduce myself and talk a little bit about MetaGeek. Um, I'm going to go over some Wi-Fi fundamentals, uh, which are pretty important to understand our tools since we are Wi-Fi troubleshooting tools. Um, we're going to go over our Insider Office product, which is a, a basic Wi-Fi scanning tool. We're going to go over Channelizer, which is the uh, spectrum analysis tool. And then we're going to go over IPA, which is a packet analysis tool, that layer two packet analysis. And then, of course, we'll open up the floor for any questions that you guys uh, might have. Um, about myself, my name is Casey. I am the uh, uh, customer experience specialist here at MetaGeek. I kind of do some training as well on the side. Um, I have my CWNA, SP, and AP, which are uh, certifications put on by the CWNP program, um, I, which I highly recommend checking out if you are interested in uh, learning a bit more about Wi-Fi, some of the, the, the detailed, complicated things. I'll just go over some general stuff, but if you really want to dive into it, I recommend CWNP program. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as well at Kathy underscore Phi. Um, there's a really good uh, um, Twitter audience out there, a really good Wi-Fi expert audience out there on Twitter as well. Um, so I highly recommend uh, kind of posing any questions on Twitter, and, and, uh, and uh, there, there's a lot of really good resources there. Uh, um, in terms of Wi-Fi about MetaGeek, uh, we're located in Boise, Idaho, <clears throat> downtown, and uh, and uh, you know we we, we kind of make the joke that um, uh, our Wi-Fi hardware, which is a spectrum analyzer that we sell, is made out of uh, Idaho-grown potatoes, um, since that seems to be what we're known for here. Um, and I'll just go ahead and jump right in. Um, basically, uh, the most important thing to know about Wi-Fi uh, is that uh, Wi-Fi is half duplex. Um, but what does that mean exactly? Um, and so the, the best way that I like to think about this is first I like to think about what an Ethernet cable is. An Ethernet cable is just a twisted pair of uh, uh, copper uh, uh, like this, and this allows traffic or uh, 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 conversations to occur in two different directions at the same time, right? Traffic can flow in uh, two different directions at the same time, whereas Wi-Fi, on the other hand, is more like a single lane highway, and traffic can only go one direction at the same time. And so what this means is only one Wi-Fi device can talk on a channel at the same time. Now, <clears throat> what does that mean exactly when you have multiple devices? Well, that means that while this conversation with this, uh, we'll just say this is like an Android phone is having a conversation with this access point, what that means is that every other device that is on this network, whether it's your iPad or another mobile device or anything, a printer or what have you, they all have to wait their turn to talk on this channel and they have to wait for this conversation to, uh, uh, to finish up with this uh, uh, one client device. Um, in the uh, 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 Wi-Fi operates on on two different bands. Um, we have the 2.4 gigahertz band and the 5 gigahertz band. Um, and uh, of course, as you guys might know, the the 2.4 gigahertz band has a little bit of a larger wavelength. Um, the actual uh, uh, size of a wavelength here is about five inches. What this means is that it has greater range, um, so it can it can travel farther. Um, and this is this is more of an indoor range. Of course, if you're outdoor, that's going to travel. Um, you know, it's going to go very very far outdoors. Um, but indoor range, you're looking at about 300 feet or so. Um, pretty much everything's going to have a 2.4 gigahertz chip in it, so everything's going to work in this band. Um, as a result, uh, it's very congested with Wi-Fi. Um, Another thing too is that it's congested by non-Wi-Fi because it's it, it has so much distance and it's it's a pretty good uh, frequency range. A lot of non-Wi-Fi devices operate here as well. Um, Walkie-talkies, uh, um, cordless phones, baby monitors, microwave ovens, 
um, can all use the 2.4 gigahertz band. Um, and since it's uh, it's not a lot of space, there's actually only three non-overlapping channels in the 2.4 gigahertz band. That's one, six, and 11. So those are really only the, the only three channels that you want to use, which isn't much. Uh, the five gigahertz band, on the other hand, um, it's a lot shorter of a wavelength. And so the actual uh, distance here between uh, uh, two waves is about 2.5 uh, inches. Um, and so it's a little smaller as a result, it has a lower indoor range. We're looking at about 90 feet indoors. Um, and uh, not everything works with the, the five gigahertz band. Uh, if you're buying budget laptops or um, kind of an older, older devices, a lot of times they aren't going to have this uh, uh, 5 gigahertz capability. They're only going to have the 2.4 gigahertz capability. Um, what's neat about the 5 gigahertz band is there's a lot of space. You can see um, how much space there is. Uh, there's 24 non-overlapping channels. You can also have, um, you know, you can have 40 megahertz wide channels. You can have 80 megahertz wide channels. And, and with the invention of 802.11 AC, you can even have 160 megahertz wide channels. Um, so a lot of, lot of room in the 5 gigahertz band as well. Um, kind of want to go over some of the history of 802.11, um, um, but uh, um, I won't get too detailed in this, but the main thing to know is that when Wi-Fi was first invented in 1997, um, the modulation scheme used was a direct sequence spread spectrum. And what this looks like on a, a spectrum analyzer is kind of this curved shape like this. And so that's that's kind of the main important thing to know here uh, is if you were to see this uh, modulation scheme, it's going to look like a kind of a curved hill. Um, and uh, um, with the invention of 802.11a, which opened up the 5 gigahertz band in 1999, uh, we, we created this orthogonal frequency division multiplex uh, modulation scheme. And what that looks like on a, on a spectrum analyzer is just more of a flat um, kind of tabletop, or we call it a ziggurat. So it's a little bit flatter. And that's, that's, this is kind of what it looks like on a... Um, on a spectrum analyzer. And so pretty much every other amendment that came out of 211G, 802.11N, and AC, and now we're going to have AX here pretty soon, uh, uh, it, it's all going to be using this OFDM modulation scheme. So you're going to see this, this uh, signature on a spectrum analyzer, um, which is which pretty important to know. Um, of course, um, of course, uh, there's only uh, 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 as like I said earlier, three channels that don't overlap in the 2.4 gigahertz band. It's channels one, six, and eleven, um, and uh, and there's only five megahertz of space in between each channel. So that's why channels two, three, four, five, th those aren't recommended because they're overlapping uh, with with those networks and overlapping channels. Um, are, are not uh, polite. Devices on an overlapping channel are not polite. Um, it's kind of important to understand the two main types of Wi-Fi interference. We have co-channel and adjacent channel interference. I think the easiest uh, example I like to use for co-channel interference is uh, is a dinner table, right? Um, you, your channel kind of represents a, a, a table. And let's say you're with your family. Um, <clears throat> Basically, you're you're allowed to have polite conversations right at the dinner table with your family. Um, you know, you you say say your dad has uh, uh, wants to say something, and so everyone listens politely, listens to your dad, and waits for their turn to talk, right? Um, and that's a pretty good example for how co-channel interference works. Of course, the more people that you have at the dinner table, the less time you have to talk, but you're still trying to be polite. You're still not trying to talk over each other. Um, adjacent channel interference, on the other hand, um, this is kind of like instead of uh, a dinner table at your home, let's say you're at a restaurant and other people have their own tables and their own conversations with their own families. And so the noise floor around you starts to get pretty loud and pretty soon you and your family are starting to have to talk very loudly to, to kind of rise above everyone else. And so it's not as polite. Um, and so that's kind of what adjacent channel interference represents. Um, and that's that's the one you're going to want to avoid the most. Um, if you have to have something, co-channel is better. So that's why it's better if you can get all your neighbors on 1, 6, and 11, as opposed to letting any neighbors use 4, or 6, or 2, or 3, or 4, or 5, excuse me. You do want them to use 6, and uh, 1, and, and 11 as well. Um, and so this is kind of what spectrum analysis is, is, is really good for. Um, uh, uh, you can see co-channel interference, you can see adjacent channel interference, but you can also see non-Wi-Fi interference with a spectrum analyzer. Um, and, uh, and uh, you know, keep in mind that these uh, non-Wi-Fi interference, um, like microwaves, cordless phones, um, Wi-Fi devices do think that it's Wi-Fi, and so they'll still wait their turn to talk for that non-Wi-Fi interference to stop interfering. 
Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, Wi-Fi scanning is really good for checking, you know, signal strengths and all the neighboring networks around you, um, things like that. Um, but uh, as soon as you uh, start using it, a spectrum analyzer, you start to get a much more clear picture to see exactly what's going on, right? So this is two side-by-side -side images of, uh, you know, just a basic Wi-Fi scanner is, is using this image right here, and you can see signal strengths, you see a couple networks, but you don't really know what's going on. Until you grab a, a spectrum analyzer, you actually see, okay, there's something uh, huge right here that's that's causing some interference, and this would actually just wreak havoc on these networks here on channels 11, you know, 10, 9, 8, 7. Any networks over in this area are just getting overloaded with this non-Wi-Fi interfere. So, you know, if you were wanting to choose a network over here, um, you know, using this image, uh, now you know you absolutely, you know, if you have to deploy a network, you have to use something over here just to avoid this uh, significant interference, or you know, or you know, to go and remove that interferer. Um, some important notes on Wi-Fi coverage. Um, uh, the, the main signal strength that we strive for here at MetaGeek and that we recommend is negative 67 dBm. So if you're deploying a network and you're not sure what a good signal strength is, uh, that this is this seems to be the answer that we like the most here at MetaGeek. Um, pretty much, uh, you sh you shouldn't have any frames drop. Um, you should be able to watch, you know, uh, you know, HD, you know, Netflix or YouTube things like that. Um, and then uh, as soon as you start to get a little bit lower than that, negative 70, negative 80, you might start uh, missing some frames. You might start getting that, you know, glitchy voice when you're on a, a, a phone conversation or video might lag, things like that. Um, and then, of course, anything higher than negative 67 dBm, you're going to be flying. It's going to be a great signal strength. Um, but, uh, yeah, we, we, we do recommend the negative uh, uh, 67 dBm there for, for Wi-Fi coverage. Um, so I'll go ahead and show you guys uh, inside our office here, give you a little little demo demo of the tool here. And again, this is just a, a basic Wi-Fi scanning tool. Um, and so it's important to know that this is kind of like a snapshot tool that you want to, this is kind of the first tool you want to bring out when you, when you have some Wi-Fi problems, because um, chances are you might be able to solve it here. Um, so right off the bat, I'm in logical mode over here at the top left, and this is basically just going to consolidate all the SSIDs around me. Um, so my personal network is this Cathify network. And what's cool, if you select this network in Insider Office, it's going to kind of uh, uh, start to colorize some things for you. So it's going to show you in yellow, it's going to show you all the co-channels uh, uh, that, that might be interfering with your network. Um, and, uh, and, and if there's uh, adjacent channel interference, it's going to mark that as red because remember adjacent channel interference is much worse, much less polite. So I'm actually looking pretty good here. I'm actually surprised that there's no adjacent channel. Oh, there's one right there. Perfect. As, as I was talking, this links this guest here. Um, it's about negative 85 dBm just popped up here and you kind of see that in red or orange a little bit. Um, and so kind of a, a really good visual, visualization just to see, you know, what's going on exactly. Another pretty neat thing is uh, uh, we, we have this chain link icon, which uh, shows you which which network you're connected to. So right now I have a dual band network set up by an Apple router. So I have a, a 2.4 gigahertz band and I have a 5 gigahertz band. Fortunately, my laptop is currently connected to the 5 gigahertz band, and I can tell that by this chain link icon right there. Um, and of course, this is a pretty cool area. This is the signal strength over time graph. Um, and so this is good for kind of testing roaming and, and making sure you're handing off from access point to access point. Um, if I were to walk around right now, you would see these, uh, uh, these uh, lines dip and raise and lower depending on how close or how far away I was getting from an access point. Really, really neat to have, really nice looking application. I highly recommend uh, this, this tool. Um, and again, you can go into physical mode and kind of break down each individual access point. Um, of course, the filtering is really easy. So if I just wanted to look at my network, uh, I just type in Kathy, hit enter. And there's just my two networks. I don't see any any neighboring activity. And uh, and what also is pretty neat, one thing I really like about this tool is if you do have a Wi-Spy DBX, which is the MetaGeek Spectrum Analyzer, which you can also purchase at Microcom. Uh, basically, if you plug that in, um, you'll start to get some uh, uh, spectrum and in, uh, spectrum information as well. So I just I w already plugged mine in, and you can kind of start to see uh, some spectrum information start to appear here. Now this is pretty neat because this is actually seeing the invisible, right? Um, you know, spectrum analyzers don't come built into laptops or things like that. You do have to purchase a, a spectrum analyzer separately, um, but inside our office can pull this in using a Wi-Spy DBX. 
Um, and uh, so now I can kind of see, okay, exactly how much is of, of the, of the air, airwaves are being utilized. Furthermore, what uh, uh, Insider Office can do for you is if you're not a Wi-Fi expert and you're not sure what channel to pick uh, for your deployment, uh, uh, Insider Office takes the guesswork out of it. So if you just select your radio that you want to uh, um, kind of uh, get a recommendation of a channel for, um, uh, it'll it'll pop out a recommendation for you automatically. So right now I'm on channel 48 and 42. Uh, I'm using an 80 megahertz wide channel here, and uh, it's it's actually recommending that I use channel 100. It's basically it's seeing that there's a little bit of view spectrum here, and it's looking at all the neighboring networks around me, and it's it's spitting out a number that it believes to be a better choice than what I'm currently on. And that's a pretty neat uh, feature, and it, it's a pretty advanced algorithm. Um, the algorithm for, algorithm for this is, is basically based on this, this channels table here, which I think is pretty neat. Um, um, basically, it, it just looks at, uh, so here's channel 100. This is the network that it recommended. Um, so it sees that there indeed are no on-channel networks. There's zero overlapping networks. Um, uh, so yeah, it's obviously a good choice. There's uh, uh, there's nothing going on there, very little spectrum utilization being used. And so that's that's most likely why it shows that. Um, but uh, it's pretty neat to be able to see these figures, you know, even in the 2.4 gigahertz band. It's just kind of fun to see, you know, on channel 11, there's 10 on-channel networks and six overlapping networks, and um, and uh, and, you, and you can kind of just get a lot of pretty cool information uh, with this tool. Um, but uh, what if there was something? What if there was some sort of significant interference? Let's just say, like right here, there's just a big, tall red spike like that, and we didn't know what it was. And uh, and this tool again is just a 30 second. Um, time span, it's not going to show you, you know, anything over time and, and it doesn't really help you identify anything that it sees on the spectrum. So what if there was something that we didn't really know what it was? Well, that's basically where uh, a channelizer comes into play. Um, so channelizer is the, uh, the deep dive into spectrum analysis is what we like to market this tool as. It helps you see the invisible um, and it helps you locate uh, uh, these non-Wi-Fi interferers as well. Uh, which is pretty neat. Um, we have a directional antenna that you can plug into it that uh, uh, kind of helps you directionally locate something if you if you don't know where it is. Um, and uh, you know, cordless phones, baby monitors, things like that. You have to remember that uh, kind of like what I said earlier, uh, these devices. Um, you know, Wi-Fi devices think that uh, this microwave, for instance, over here is a Wi-Fi device. So they're waiting their turn to talk until, you know, this burrito is done microwaving, for instance, uh, which is pretty frustrating. And that happens a lot, actually, um, at lunchtime. A lot of Wi-Fi uh, issues occur <laughs> because of this exact reason. And so it's really important to kind of uh, have a spectrum analyzer to look at this. Um, a baby monitor is another good example of where channelizer would be helpful for because uh, baby monitors frequency hop. They This one right here went from one and then it went over to channel nine and then it switched over to channel five. And so that can be pretty frustrating and uh, and hard to troubleshoot. Um, here's a, a Bluetooth signature that we pulled when in Channelizer. So Bluetooth, uh, typically you need to have a lot of Bluetooth to uh, uh, become a problem for your Wi-Fi because they are really light and fast. So if you have one device, it's not gonna be a problem. But if you start you know, having 20, 30 devices all uh, uh, doing some Bluetooth file transfers or things like that, that could start to interfere with your Wi-Fi network. Um, here's a, a, a signature of a, a old analog wireless video camera, which uh, they got rid of these for obvious reasons. They were just they were just wrecking the the Wi-Fi bands here and uh, just causing tons of issues. Um, and so thankfully we got rid of those. Um, you know, I always like to say uh, channelizer is a lot like a DVR. You can pause and rewind and fast forward and and uh, and really do what you want with this the spectrum data. Um, so it's a really good tool to kind of set your laptop down and uh, go take a lunch break, make a recording, um, come back to it and see okay what happened in the spectrum. Uh, you, I mean, you can go three to four hours, you can go 24 hours if you have a, a large enough hard drive on your computer, uh, so on and so forth. Um, and then uh, what's really cool is once you uh, have made that recording, you can actually just customize uh, uh, some reports and send this to your client if you need to prove something happened on your network. Uh, very professional looking, very easy to use. I'll, I'll show you guys this in a second. And then another really cool feature that I like to uh, show off is the uh, Cisco Clean Air accessory. 
Um, so if you do deploy Cisco access points, you can actually remotely log in and, and view the spectrum from the perspective of that access point. And those Cisco access points have really good uh, uh, high resolution spectrum analyzers built into them. So you can really see some details of what's going on with the spectrum. And that's just an additional accessory that you can grab from Microcom as well. So I will go ahead and hop into Channelizer and, and kind of show you guys what this tool looks like and some, some neat things that it can do. So the first thing, uh, first thing I wanted to show you actually is I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna exit out and go back into it. I want to I'm gonna unplug my Y spy and show you what what Channelizer looks like without a Y spy attached because it does need to have a Y spy to uh, pull in real environmental RF. Um, but uh, I did want to show that there is a trial version available uh, of Channelizer and you can kind of uh, you can actually look at some uh, sample recordings and and kind of um, get a feel for it and see what it is. I highly recommend if you just Google Channelizer trial, you can actually uh, get a trial of this. But once you plug in a YSPY DBX, which I'll go ahead and do now, um, it's gonna it's gonna see it. Uh, there's YSPY DBX, and it's gonna start sweeping the 2.4 band. Uh, immediately, the first thing I like to do is I like to sweep both bands. So I'm gonna go to YSPY and click dual band, and, uh, and I want this to dedicate its resources to sweeping the 2.4 and the 5 gigahertz band. And uh, you're going to notice this is a lot like uh, inside our office here. Um, basically, it's 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 showing me spectrum, and it also has some Wi-Fi scanning capabilities uh, right here in the networks table. So I can uh, I can uncheck you know what networks I don't want to see and check just Kathy Phi, which is my network. Um, and uh, you, you know still you can see the signal strength over time graph. Um, but uh, but really this is uh, the main focus of this is spectrum analysis. So what I'm going to do is we actually have a pretty good recording of a uh, interferer, a non-Wi-Fi interferer that I really like to use here. Um, let's see if I can find it. Yeah. So this this one was taken by a MediGeek employee, and uh, and it's just a great illustration of how useful Channelizer can be for this uh, use case. Um, and so at this point, uh, uh, what, what's cool is this is. Um, Time stamped over here. If you look, this was at 9:28 in the morning, and uh, we just let Channelizer run for a few minutes, basically. And you can kind of see right here. You can see something's going to be happening here on the waterfall, uh, waterfall of use. Right now, this is just like as if you know the person recording had just started recording, just opened up Channelizer. This is what they would see. Nothing too much going on. Remember, blue is less than 10% of the spectrum is being utilized. Uh, if you were to see green, that's about 10 to 20%. Um, orange and red just means that over 50% of the spectrum is being utilized. So if you see red, you know something's going on. Uh, what's really neat is you can actually just go over to this waterfall view and you can just click and you can just drag over this and bam, it's going to show you that interfere or exactly what happened, which is pretty neat. Um, so I just basically fast forwarded over to this area and I just paused it. Um, and so now I'm looking at this interferer and I'm saying, okay, what the heck is this thing? I have no idea what this is, but it's causing some issues on my network because maybe I have a network on channel six, right? And you can go find out too. It looks like there was actually a network here. Yeah, there was a network here on channel five. So this would have just destroyed this network. So what is this thing? Uh, a really neat feature that Channelizer has is the interferers tab. Uh, so if you go to this interferers tab, you can actually select various interferers and you can drag it up and see if it matches. We used to have auto detection, but we just found that too many things look too similar. You have to have a human kind of just dragging this stuff up. So it's not as valuable to have auto detection in my opinion. Um, so you can tell that no, this isn't 802.11b. Doesn't look like it's Wi-Fi. I mean, this thing's only five megahertz wide long. Is it an AV transmitter? So you can select this, drag it up. Not quite. There's some shoulders there that uh, aren't accounted for on this particular signature. You know, you can even drag up Bluetooth. It's really handy to know what signatures look like as well. So here's Bluetooth, and you can actually um, you can actually put your own signatures into this library, which is pretty neat. If you find something that's not here, you can make your own uh, a, a signature and, and and find it in the future, which is pretty cool. What this ended up being was a unit in phone. So if you put the unit in phone signature up here and and uh, and and throw it, up, it looks about right. Um, this was indeed a unit in phone, those old, uh, you know, early 2000s uh, cell phones, or they weren't even cell phones, they're just wireless wireless phones. Um, those cause a lot of havoc. Fortunately, they seem to not be as popular anymore, I think, with uh, the invention of cell phones, but some people still have them and they still do uh, a lot of, uh, uh, cause a lot of issues. Um, and uh, so it's cool if you had to uh, uh, kind of, uh, you know, send this over to a client who maybe 
doesn't believe that it's you know something you can actually build a pretty neat report here um, and so uh, you just go to report builder new report and uh, if I wanted to uh, I have this pretty much dialed in exactly where I wanted if I wanted to add uh, the density graph here and kind of show uh, what what this signature was uh, it auto fills it with this these words which is really nice it tells you what blue means what green yellow and red mean uh, makes you look really professional of course you can edit this if you want to you can go and uh, you know, add your own 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 words here if you'd like to, um, which is pretty cool. But uh, um, you know, if you want to throw a networks table down there to show what your signal strengths were like and uh, and what where your networks were uh, during the time of this, uh, you know, whatever you have selected over here in your waterfall menu, um, makes you look really professional. Um, and uh, and you can print this out. You can you know save it as a PDF or what have you. And uh, it's a, it's a pretty great feature if that's something that uh, you know if you need to kind of uh, send some reports to a client. And lastly, the uh, the Cisco Clean Air accessory here. So um, pretty easy menu item, really easy to get to. All you need is the IP address and the NSI key of your uh, Cisco AP, and you can start to uh, remote in into that. Um, and you do need to have the uh, 2800 or the 3800. There's a couple other APs that you can use for this. Um, um, and then you do have to have uh, some updated controller firmware as well for this. Um, so, but kind of the, the transition here is, is uh, uh, what if there was something that, uh, um, you know, maybe we're like over here, and maybe you're still having Wi-Fi issues and you don't see any sort of, uh, you don't see any sort of uh, uh, spectrum issues. You can't really uh, figure out the problem with uh, uh, just a basic Wi-Fi scanner like Inside or Channelizer is not helping. Maybe you have an application that uh, uh, you know isn't able, or a device that still can't connect, or it's getting slow Wi-Fi. You're able to get Wi-Fi, but it's just slow throughput. Um, 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 what's the next step, right? If if you can't solve the problem with layer one. Well, that's basically where IPA comes into. So, you know, with Channelizer and Insider Office, we started with a uh, layer one. The next step would be to move to this layer two, which is the packet layer. Um, and so, like I was showing you earlier, spectrum analysis can show you all the sum of activity on the channel, right? The utilization, how much is it being used? Whereas packet analysis is gonna dive into the details of the conversation uh, between a client and an access point. So you can really see, okay, what's going wrong here? Is it is it connecting correctly to the access point? Is there a handshake going on? Um, and so on and so forth. It's still really important to remember that uh, Wi-Fi is half duplex. Uh, so only one device can talk on a channel at a time. And what this means um, uh, in terms of the packet layer, that's really important to understand. Uh, this is really important when, when, when talking about um, data rates, right? So, uh, you know, let's just say you have this uh, client device. Let's say it's across the street and it's connected to your network still. And this, this user's trying to watch uh, YouTube or, or check Facebook or something like that. Well, it can only, you know, resort to this low one megabit per second um, uh, uh, data rate. Um, well, that still means that even if you're right next to the router, this device, which can pot potentially unlock 54 megabit per second, right, really fast, it still has to wait its turn to talk. This device has to wait its turn to talk. So all these devices have to wait until this device right here is finished its conversation at one megabit per second. Uh, a lot of times we like to think of this as the slow kid in the back of the classroom that raises his hand, grinds the lecture to a halt, and just says, oh, teach, and you know has some sort of question that maybe isn't relevant to the material, and all these other students, all these other devices just have to wait, right? Wait their turn to talk. Um, and IPA is, is really great at showing this uh, uh, type of information. Uh, we, we do this with a couple different uh, uh, frame types. We show you the management frames is purple, control frames is orange, and data frames is blue. And, uh, and uh, uh, management frames are probably my favorite frames personally. Um, these are th these basically just, uh, um, you know, th these basically just help stations get on and off a network, right? Um, so a beacon frame is uh, 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 basically beacons come from access points. Um, for instance, my access point, I'm using the Apple um, Airport router, and uh, about every 100 milliseconds or about 10 times a second, uh, my access point is saying, hey, I'm Casey's network, I'm here, I support these data rates, I support this encryption type, you connect me. And every single access point does this 10 times a second. It's It's actually pretty crazy to think about um, and so we're, we're, we're going to show you how many how many how much your, your, your networks are beaconing um, probes on the other hand come from your client device right so this comes from my actual iPhone my iPhone saying hey Casey's network are you there um, you know I once connected to the Boise Airport right and so even though I'm not at the airport my phone is still saying hey Boise Airport are you there can I connect to you 
um, it, whenever I'm not associated to the Wi-Fi. It's why people say to turn off your uh, uh, Wi-Fi if you want to save battery life, right? Because your, your client devices are constantly probing for networks out there. And uh, it's it, again, it's kind of crazy to think about, but that's what's happening. And then of course, authentication is if you do have a, a WPA um, uh, WPA's, you know, sort of uh, encrypted network. Um, you have to authenticate the device and then uh, uh, finally associating to the network, right? These are all management frames, um, which we do display as purple. Um, we do show control frames, which just aid in the delivery of management and data frames, right? These are kind of like, uh, the, I like to think of walkie talkies as this, right? Acknowledgements is like a Roger, right? Roger that, like I acknowledge that you just said something. Um, unfortunately with wireless mediums, you know, you do have to have these types of uh, um, uh, frames in order to uh, ensure the delivery of the data. Um, a block acknowledgement just allows for more data to go through. Um, so instead of uh, uh, something like data, ACK, data, ACK, it's data, 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 ACK, right? It's a, they, they, they block an acknowledgement so that more data can pass through. This came in, uh, I think, with the invention of 802.11n. Um, and then uh, 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 clear to send. Um, and request to send are, uh, are, are just uh, two more kind of like, uh, you know, if you think of a, a walkie talkie conversation, you know, uh, clear to send, you know, request to send, just uh, uh, the device just wants to uh, uh, speak with the access point basically. And we show that as, as orange frames. And then finally, data frames. These are the only frames that uh, aren't specific to 802.11 protocol. Uh, data frames are, you know, the actual, you know, YouTube videos going out to Google, right? Um, and then we, we do have a quality of service data frame here, which just is a, a little bit higher priority uh, data. This is like voice is usually QoS data. As long as the voice goes through when you're having a video conversation, the video can lag and it usually will lag first if you have a poor connection. But the last thing to, uh, uh, to go is gonna be voice because it's marked as quality of service. And then uh, null data is actually just a power save thing. They just didn't know where to put it. Uh, and so they, they threw it under uh, uh, data frames here. Um, uh, one thing that's kind of uh, very interesting, very complex, but I, I find it fascinating is the airtime arbitration process. So um, I, I told you before that only one Wi-Fi device can talk on a channel at a time. Well, how do they decide which one talks first, right? Um, you know, if you start to think about it, it's like, oh yeah, that would be difficult. They can't just both start talking at the same time. They'd cancel each other out, right? Um, so basically the long story short here is that uh, the device essentially roll the dice to decide who 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 who, uh, <clears throat> who goes first, and so we call those random back off slots. And so they they roll the dice, and in this example, um, this this station two here, which we'll just say is a client device, this station basically rolled a seven, and uh, and this client device over here it rolled a nine, right? And so they count off. To, to nine, they start counting off. They say, you know, they have a, a, a diffs, which is basically a, sp a space. Um, basically, it's like a, a breath. And uh, and then they just go one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it says, oh, I rolled a seven. I request to send some data. The access point says you're clear to send. And then they begin to have their conversation, right? Whether it's YouTube or Facebook, whatever this is. And meanwhile, this station four, which rolled a nine, it says it defers. And it and it and it and it lets everything talk and it stays quiet. But it's it's it remembers that it has two left on its roll, right? And so then this conversation ends over here. It rolls a ten. This still has two, so they count one, two. This station over here now uh, begins sending its data, right? Um, and so this is a pretty fascinating process. It gets you know really really complicated. But uh, essentially the takeaway is, is these client devices basically roll the dice, and you can kind of see this information in in IPA. Um, before in the past, uh, the, the only software that was uh, used to kind of look at packets was called Wireshark, which is open source. It was made by some very smart engineers, um, and you kind of have to know what you're doing to use it. It can be very difficult to visualize airtime, very difficult to understand what's going on, because it's literally just a list of packets. Uh, so very confusing. Um, this is exactly why IPA was built. Um, just in the spare time, I think, of some of our engineers, we decided to just visualize this information. So we do it with uh, these little pie charts. Um, and so if you look at the very first little sliver here, this is the actual network. Um, and so if you look here, this network was uh, uh, was taking up about 50% of the total airtime. Let's just say we were doing a capture on channel one here, right, uh, in the 2.4 gigahertz band. This, uh, this entire sliver here was taken up by one network on channel one. So, you know, that's 
pretty cool to see immediately. And then the next little sliver out is the actual access point. So this uh, this network looks like it maybe only had one access point anyways, but uh, so this one access point was taking up all the uh, the airtime. And then finally, uh, or the third little uh, sliver out here, this is the actual client device on the access point. So this this could be uh, this could be a little Apple device, right? Um, maybe it's a, a iPad or something like that. Whereas, uh, and then here's another client device, you know, taking up this much space, which, you know, obviously the iPad here was taking up a lot more and you're just instantly visualizing this stuff, which is pretty cool. And then finally, the, the very outermost layer here is the actual frame type. So, you know, that this iPad was just sending tons of data because blue is, it, we mark uh, data frames as blue. So we just know this was tons of data. This is probably a healthy looking network, honestly. You don't wanna see a lot of blue. You don't wanna see a lot of management overhead, beacons, things like that. You don't wanna see a ton of orange. Uh, you just wanna see a little bit of orange because you need these to aid in the delivery of the uh, data packets. Uh, so this is actually looking like a pretty good healthy network over here, um, but uh, uh, you can immediately gather that, which is pretty cool in IPA. Um, I was kind of going over this before, we show all these different types of frames and the colors. Um, really easy to get an idea of, of what you're seeing. Now IPA uses, uh, uh, you can use a lot of different packet capture sources. Uh, we, we, we uh, Microcom and, and MediGeek distribute uh, this uh, 802.11ac adapter right now. We're, we're, we're giving off the Edimax, uh, this specific model. It's a three by three spatial stream adapter. Um, so it's actually pretty good. And this is uh, supported within IPA. So you can actually capture packets on Windows in IPA, which is actually a pretty uh, difficult feat. Um, uh, you can also, if you have a MacBook Air or a MacBook Pro, uh, those have really good packet capture adapters as well, which you can uh, take a, a, a packet capture and import that into IPA. And then, of course, we have other, uh, uh, you can, you know, a lot of enterprise, enterprise grade access points like Cisco and Ruckus and uh, uh, various, you know, Meraki, those types of access points will actually spit out PCAPs for you. And, uh, and as long as there's nothing weird in the PCAP, uh, you can actually import that into IPA and, and visualize that data as well, uh, which is pretty neat. Um, so yeah, I'll go ahead and hop into IPA and kind of uh, show you some, some cool things. I'm excited for this too, because we've updated this software quite a bit. We, 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 we seem to be focusing on this software right now quite a bit. Um, uh, the first thing that we've recently added here is uh, uh, before we didn't show you any sort of uh, hardwire information like 802.1x, right, which is Ethernet, uh, which we do now. So this is pretty cool. This was, uh, uh, we actually show you the uh, the, the four-way handshake now. So you can actually kind of dive into this information, which is pretty cool. And if you go to the packets here, you can actually see this uh, four-way handshake, which is just an authentic authentication, basically. Um, uh, uh, with 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 secure enterprise networks, um, we didn't show this type of stuff before because it was non Wi-Fi. But uh, we recently just uh, added this feature, which is pretty neat. Um, one thing I did want to show you is um, this packet capture, which was taken by a, a customer. Actually, um, this this uh, this uh, customer set up um, as you can see here uh, many many virtual SSIDs on this one channel. And, uh, and so you can see there was uh, an onboarding network, there was a staff network, a students, a VR network, another guest network, a bring your own device network, guest networks. A lot of people, they, you know, they think, you know, that, you know, they probably don't know much about Wi-Fi, but they think it's a, you know, a good idea to uh, set up as many virtual SSIDs as possible. But what this does is, as you can see, uh, IPA shows you this immediately. Th these are all beacon frames, right? This gray data. We, we, re we recently made this color gray instead of purple. Uh, to kind of uh, uh, show that it's it's not ideal. Uh, you don't want a lot of gray, right? This is a dead uh, environment. There's only a little bit of activity here and there, um, and there's no actual data being passed forth here. Even though there's 10 clients, there's 35 networks, so there's not even enough networks for each client to connect to, and there's just almost no data actually being passed here. It's all just these networks. Like I told you, 10 times a second, every network says, I'm this network, I support these data rates, you can connect to me. Well, that starts to eat up airtime, right? And so you can look at this airtime graph right here, and you can just see that a quarter of the airtime is completely reserved for these beacons, right? 10 times a second, these 35 SSIDs are all beaconing their data rates, their encryption types, and they want clients to connect to them. And uh, if you were to actually uh, get some data, if you were to you know, connect an iPad up to this network, you're now restricted to only this much airspace for that, right? Uh, you're just, it's just a silly thing to do, but it's really easy to see here with, uh, with IPA what's going on. Uh, what's, what else is pretty cool with IPA is uh, um, 
you know, you can dive into it. So let's say we're having some issues with this, this virtual SSID. You can click on it and it expands it. And now we go out to the actual access point. So I actually want to look at this access point and click on it and expands it. We have uh, this access, access point, like, like I was just saying, uh, this broadcast, there's no clients on here. Um, not a single, oh, it looks like there was a Samsung. There was a Samsung device on here, which had a sliver. I mean, it just was doing nothing. It was basically null data. It was just in power save mode. So it was just on, it was just on the network, not doing anything. Everything else was a broadcast, right? The beacon 10 times a second. Um, so let's say we wanted to take a look at this, maybe the Samsung device, right? This would be pretty fun. So I'm just gonna dive into the Samsung device and, uh, and go to file and then send a Wireshark. Um, so if I really wanted to troubleshoot some issues with this Samsung device, right, I just filtered so quickly, so easily right to that Samsung device on that very specific network. Uh, this is very difficult to do in Wireshark. Typically, uh, you have to really know what you're doing, but now I can just quickly filter using IPA, dive into Wireshark and look at what I need to, which is pretty neat. Um, another example I wanted to show you, uh, uh, here's, uh, this one was taken in the, uh, um, office. I took this one actually. Uh, this was just streaming Netflix from my iPhone to an Apple TV. Um, and so, you know, here's the MediGeek uh, 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 network that I was using. Um, we were just one access point was all I could see here on this channel, uh, which we called the Plink. And, uh, and uh, there were only two devices. Oh, it looks like there are a couple other devices here. Um, but these were probably just my coworkers that were quite a ways away since they're not eating up too much uh, airtime here. Um, but uh, what was cool is you can actually uh, you can actually dive into this network and you can kind of go to this uh, analyze tab over here at the top right. And if you put a star next to your network, it'll give you some pretty cool insights, right? So this one particularly says, oh, it has a high retransmit rate, 4.7%, right? Um, and it kind of gives you a little bit of some solutions. Say, hey, this Apple device was uh, resending frames over and over again. Something might be going on here. And it gives you some cool solutions, right? You know, it could be a Wi-Fi chipset issue. You click learn more. It could be, um, you know, it could be some overlapping interference. It could be some non-Wi-Fi interference, right? And so we recommend grabbing a spectrum analyzer. So these tools really talk to each other quite well uh, between Insider and IPA. It's, it's, it's pretty nice to have the complete suite of these tools. And, uh, and it's pretty cool to have these issues, which we're working on this quite a bit. We're uh, uh, trying to come up with a, a little bit more um, uh, insights to uh, provide you guys. But uh, yeah, that's pretty much uh, uh, it for IPA. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pass it back to Julie and see if we have any questions. Hey, Casey, thank you very much for that wonderful presentation. And yes, we do have questions for you. Thank you for that. Um, let's go ahead and get started with this first one. Um, can you tell us why outdoor signal travels um, better and further than indoor? <laughs> yeah, uh, basically just because indoor, you know, there's walls, there's people, there's, um, you know, there's, there's uh, doors, there's, you know, just things are in the way. And uh, any sort of physical object is going to attenuate the signal. Whereas when you're outdoors, chances are, you know, unless you're, you know, let's just say you're at a, a you know, no trees or anything like that. Um, the only thing that's going to stop your signal is what's called free space path loss. And so just basically, it's almost like just the air molecules are the only things that are attenuating your RF. And that attenuates very slowly. You can, you know, if, if there wasn't any air molecules out there, the RF would travel forever, right? I mean, in space, it goes forever. So um, yeah, mainly the only reason why indoor has a less range is because there's objects in the way that attenuate the signal, that stop the signal from, from going further, right? Uh, whereas outdoors, you have less of that stuff. Uh, if you have a really heavily wooded environment, then it's probably going to be just the same as if it were indoors because there's trees in the ways, right? But um, yeah, that's, that's the main reason. Thank you, Casey. That makes sense. I appreciate that. Uh, next question here. Um, what's the best channel on the 5 gigahertz band? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, typically, uh, you know, th 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 it just depends what is being used already around you. If you're the first person to claim a network in the five gigahertz band, almost any of them is going to be just fine. One thing I will say is uh, 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 the five gigahertz band is split into three or four different sections. We call it Uni 1, Uni 2, Uni 2E, and Uni 3, so four sections. Um, I recommend using Uni 1 and Uni 3, which is basically the first part of the 5 gigahertz band and the very last part of the 5 gigahertz band. The middle part of the 5 gigahertz band, I want to say it's starting at channel 100, but I don't have my uh, 5 gigahertz band uh, uh, cheat sheet in front of me right now. But uh, um, 
the second part, the Uni 2E and the Uni 2 are, are both uh, reserved for DFS or Doppler radar events. And so sometimes Doppler radar can come in and, and, and it'll force a uh, network to switch over to uh, uh, Uni 1 or Uni 3. So I usually recommend either Uni 1 or Uni 3, which is, you know, I think it's channels 36 to channel 100. Those are all really great channels to use. And then I think um, I want to say it's like channels 144 at about 165. Uh, that's Uni 3. Uh, th th those are all great channels to use. But really, everything's good if, you know, it just depends on what's being used around you, really. Excellent. Thank you very much. Next question here for you. Um, what is the best range to place on the 5 gigahertz? The best range? Um, I'm not entirely sure what that question uh, means. But uh, if if we're looking at uh, signal strength um, uh, from a signal strength perspective, you know, you still want to shoot for that negative 67 dBm or lower signal strength. And uh, and one thing that's kind of nice about five gigahertz band, if you if you deploy a five gigahertz network, chances are that uh, um, you know, let's just say, let's if you think about a hotel, for instance, with with different rooms, a lot of people will actually place an access point in each individual room because the five gigahertz signal can't pierce through the walls as well. So you can get your own five gigahertz little kind of uh, it's like a coverage cell is what we call it. And each room has its own coverage cell. Um, that tends to be really great because um, you know, the, the five gigahertz bands aren't bleeding out into each other too much. You do want just one clear and contending access point in each coverage cell. So, um, you know, as long as you're getting that of 67 dBm or better, and you're just getting that from one access point, you're not seeing that coming from two or three or four access points, your client might get confused at that point. Um, uh, you're going to be good to go. So again, um, if you're talking about five gigahertz, 2.4 gigahertz, they, they're the, you know, same thing, the same rules apply. You just want one clear and contending access point and uh, negative 67 dBm or better signal strength is usually pretty good. I hope that answered that question. Yes, thank you, Casey, so much for that. Uh, next question here for you. Um, does the spectrum analyzer have a basic parts suggestion after running reports? A basic, oh, mm, if, if he's talking about like a auto, like an inside or, or, or something like that, um, no, there, there isn't any sort of, yeah, that, that 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 would be a little too smart uh, 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 for us to do. I, I don't think there's any real way to kind of, you know, recommend certain parts or anything like that. Um, so no, that I, I don't. If I understand that question correctly, there's not really a way for the spectrum analyzer to see that. It's just a raw spectrum analyzer, so it's just looking at anything that's making noise in the 2.4 or 5 gigahertz band. Thank you for that, Casey. Next mm -hmm. question for you. Um, regarding co-channel or adjacent channel, which is the better setup? Yeah, it's better to have co-channel interference. Um, uh, absolutely. With co-channel interferers, your, your Wi-Fi devices are polite. They actually see each other on the channel and they say, oh, I see that you're having a conversation. I'm going to step back and be polite. Whereas if it sees something on an adjacent channel, that just that network protocol isn't there. So it's going to try and yell and talk more loudly. And then it's just going to slowly increase the noise floor. So um, you're always going to want to shoot. If you have to have any interference, co-channel is better than adjacent channel. Thank you so much for that next question here for you. Um, will Channelizer work with a mobile phone or, the so or does the software need to be installed in a Windows computer? Yeah, that's a great question. Right now, Channelizer is Windows only. Um, that's most likely going to be how it is. It's it's always been Windows. Um, we are currently working on a mobile application at this time, and it's going to be available uh, for resale at Microcom as well. Uh, we're we're going to call it the uh, Air Viewer, but it's going to work with the the Spy Air, and uh, and that's uh, going to be out here pretty soon. But uh, that will work on mobile devices. But no, at the moment, Channelizer doesn't work on mobile. Um, it's actually pretty difficult to get any sort of Wi-Fi scanning application out on a mobile device because, uh, uh, you know, Apple and Google, they restrict the Wi-Fi scanning capabilities on those devices. So they don't allow the user to use those chipsets to, to troubleshoot Wi-Fi. They kind of lock that up so that nothing breaks, right? So, um, no, Channelizer won't work on mobile, but uh, we are working on a workaround here, and hopefully next time we'll uh, give you some more information on that as well. 
Thank you very much, Casey. And you may have already answered my next question because the next question was uh, or is, uh, does it work on all platforms, for example, Mac, Linux, and Windows? And I believe you said just Windows. Right, yeah, Channelizer is just Windows. Insider Office, however, does work with Mac. Um, and so uh, that, that's a good program to, to grab if you, if you do you know, have to have a Mac, uh, native Mac um, application. But uh, otherwise, yeah, Channelizer and IPA, which were the latter two pieces of software I showed, those are Windows only. So if you had a Mac, you would have to run it in a virtual machine uh, to work. Understood. Thank you. Next question here. Um, will MetaGeek release an independent device or channelizer, which doesn't need to be installed anywhere, for example, something that has its own screen? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know if we're going to dive into that type of hardware. I think we're always going to probably use either, you know, a desktop screen or a mobile device screen um, to kind of present the information. I think we're going to try and more focus on software development. Um, and so kind of like what I said earlier, we, we do have this Y Spy Air coming out here soon, which is going to work on your mobile device, but it is a hardware device that you have to use in conjunction with the screen. But uh, no, we, we probably won't be developing anything with its own screen. Uh, the hardware costs involved with that is pretty uh, large and, and there's just so many good uh, screens already out there. You know, most people already have a, some sort of cell phone or a laptop or, or something like that, that that are great screens and, and easy to write software for. So we'll probably just stick to uh, uh, software and, and in terms of hardware, we're just going to probably only provide uh, spectrum analyzers and Wi-Fi scanners um, and, uh, and, and, you know, packet capture adapters, things like that. But uh, no, we probably won't develop anything with with screens. Understood. Thank you for that answer, Casey. Last question. Is there a demo link to access IPA? Yeah, there is a there is a trial of IPA. Absolutely. If you just Google IPA trial version, uh, the very first result should be a, 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 a link to get a trial key. And then absolutely, you can you can try it out. And chances are you might have an adapter that works with it or some sort of uh, way to grab a packet capture. So another thing to Google is uh, packet capture sources and then IPA and you can kind of see what you can use. Um, chances are you could probably get some real information from your environment uh, if you have one of those adapters. I think they're like 20 or 30 bucks on Amazon. So um, pretty easy entry point to get into uh, packet capture uh, uh, environment uh, in IPA, but absolutely there is a trial available. Excellent. Thank you, Casey, so much for answering all those questions for us today. And also thank you to everyone for attending today's webinar. If anyone has any further questions, please feel free to contact your sales rep or email us at sales at microcomtech.com. And if anyone wishes to view any of the products mentioned or shown here today, please visit us at www.microcom.us. And please remember this webinar presentation has been recorded and, we, and it will be uploaded to our Microcom YouTube channel so you can view it again. Casey, appreciate your time. As always, thank you again for all this valuable information today. And everybody have a wonderful day. Thanks, Julie. You're welcome.